Today on the BWI Daily Edition, we're talking about Senior Day. Should certain players come back? They all have the option to because of COVID-19 and 2020. So the players that obviously come to the top of your mind would be senior defensive tackle PJ Mustafer and, of course, starting quarterback Sean Clifford. Should those players opt to return for 2022? And there's two different ways to look at this. From their perspective, do they want to? Does their NFL future need to be put on hold another year if there is one? And from the team perspective, does the team want them back? And should the fans, and today we're going to be talking mostly about Sean Clifford, should the fans want Sean Clifford back in 2022, knowing Drew Aller and Bo Perbula will be both true freshmen that are entering as of now early at Penn State in uh, the early signing period. So how does that all work out? Before we get into that, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. You don't miss any of the stuff going on this offseason as we end and dwindle down here in the final weeks of Penn State football. Hit the subscribe button, hit the notification button so you don't miss anything. And of course, if you like the video, like the video. Also, if you notice, it's brought to you by Manscaped this holiday season. I'm giving thanks for our friends at Manscaped. Do I tell my extended family that I have the Performance 4.0 package? The global leaders in below-the-waist grooming? I can't say that I'm going to mention that, but I will mention it to you. Not to mention, it includes a lawnmower 4.0 trimmer to tame my bush and score brownie points with the in-laws. Reading this, just so you know. Gift yourself Manscaped for your life, for the man in your life who needs it. Join 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with 20% off plus free shipping. Use the promo code 20PSU you see at the bottom by going to manscaped.com. Okay, let's get into the conversation about Sean Clifford by prefacing what James Franklin had to say about Senior Day during his weekly press conference. You know, everything's kind of changed, obviously, with, with the COVID deal. It's, it's, made it, it's made it different, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, we had a number of guys that, um, you know, took part in, in the senior ceremony last year and then still decided to come back. Um, so I think our staff, as well as the players, understand um, some guys may not walk um, with the intention on coming back. Some guys may walk um, and still haven't made that decision yet um, until we sit down after the season and, and decide. Um, so it's it's very different. It's very different, Greg. Um, and I, I wish I wish I wish I could have a better answer for you, but it's it's hard to it's hard to you know say right now. Uh, just based on everybody in the program having another year. Uh, actually, uh, Andy Frank, our recruiting coordinator, you know, had a meeting with our compliance department uh, just to kind of go through it all, even from a recruiting perspective. It's, it's just kind of a mess. And that's why it's not just as cut and dried of should players come back, it's can they? Does Penn State have enough scholarships? Now, from the two players that we mentioned at the beginning, Mustafer, defensive tackle, it's really about risk management for him. If he feels that he put enough tape on film, and I thought he was very good during the early part of his senior season, that he's a draftable player or some team is going to pick him up knowing that he has an injury, which I'm going to go ahead and speculate is probably an ACL, although I don't have that confirmed. Uh, is he confident knowing that you know, he's going to gamble on his NFL draft future that he didn't, he's not going to be healthy to go through the testing drills and he's not going to be able to put anything else on film and know that he's not going to be really anything his rookie season while he's recovering from that knee injury. Then on the flip side, if he comes back, is he healthy to put good film on? Will teams take that into account? And can he recover in time to make all that happen? To me, I think that coming back would be the right answer for him. Uh, and for Penn State, losing Derek Tangelo, who is having a good year and will most likely be moving on as well. He would be a welcome addition as a veteran presence once again in a young defensive line group that might actually be able to help him out next year from a real standpoint. For Sean Clifford, it's a little bit more murky. First off, very few 25-year-old quarterbacks are drafted. If Sean Clifford comes back, that's his reality. He's a fifth-year senior, and truthfully... I think for the most part, he's been good this year. This has been the best he's played throughout his career, and I'm including 2019. If you don't look at 2019 just as win-loss record for Penn State, which the quarterback is partly responsible for, but not completely, 
Uh, he's been much better this year than he was then, making more accurate passes, throwing for more yards, throwing for fewer interceptions. He's been good. And uh, 17 touchdowns, 6 interceptions, 2,500 yards, all of those uh, metrics are in the top 5 in positive, or at least in the top 8 in terms of interceptions in the Big Ten. So, he's done his part. But it's how he gets there that makes you go week to week wanting him back so that he can be the buffer in between the rocket-armed phenom Drew Aller or the underdog scrappy winner guy who we're now labeling these ways in Bo Perbula and Drew Aller. So should he come back? Well, I think that has as much to do with the young offensive linemen that we're going to maybe see over the next three games as it does Clifford himself because of the way he plays. When Sean Clifford has a clean pocket, he's a good quarterback. All those numbers jump into the top five in the Big Ten. Passer rating, 104.9 is fourth. Adjusted completion percentage, 77.9, almost 78%. That's fifth in the Big Ten. And of course, 2,100, almost 2,200 yards passing from a clean pocket, that's fourth. So he's been getting yards and he's been getting touchdowns and completions when he is clean. The problem is when he's not. Because Sean Clifford turns into one of the worst quarterbacks in the Big Ten. The most interceptions in the Big Ten, he's tied for that with five, when under pressure. His adjusted completion percentage drops from almost 80 to 56%. And here's the important part. Percentages be damned about how many of his dropbacks. 128 times he's been under pressure so far this season. That's the second most in the Big Ten. And that's really the thing is, it's all on him. Everything's on him. So when everyone around him works and performs well, then he's a good quarterback and Penn State has a chance of winning. The explosive plays from the run game, the lack of support there is the biggest difference between Penn State's winning and losing so far this season, how it's flipped. Um, and... And that will have to be fixed by next year. Nick Singleton, another freshman coming in, expected to be a part of that. Some young guys developing behind the scenes in Keziah Holmes. And then, of course, the offensive line. That, to me, is the key part of if Sean Clifford would benefit from coming back and putting better tape on film. Because if he's under pressure all the time, it does him no good. And it does Penn State no good because he can't win that way. So this is what James Franklin had to say about young offensive linemen that he's hoping to get in games over the final three games, including the bowl game. Starting with four-star offensive lineman from 2020, Landon Tengwall. I'd like to get Landon um, some experience these last couple games. That there's no doubt about it. You know, I think you guys have seen Efner has played. We'd like, we'd like to get him some more experience as well. Um, Olu's another guy that, that, that we're very high on and, and would like to get, get him some experiences. Um, some games we've we've planned on doing that, and an injury has not allowed us to do that. Um, whether it's with our starting five or whether it's with one of the backups um, that we plan to get in, but yeah, we, we'd love to be able to get those guys some experience. You know, especially these you know these last three games. So that's going to be what I'm watching over the final three games is those young offensive linemen, when and if they get a chance to get in the game, how do they perform? Because protecting Sean Clifford and opening up holes in the running game is the key to all of this next year, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Uh, because this season, and this is actually Caden Wallace, has, has fought back to be slightly below average so far in the Big Ten. He had a big lead on most pressures given up in the Big Ten over the first five or six games of the season. He has tw uh, 29 so far this season. That is fourth in the Big Ten. Rasheed Walker is expected to move on after this season, although he hasn't had a... A stellar campaign or a pristine performance in any game so far so that is speculation as well but likely a guy that is moving on so Penn State's tackles whether they've been good or bad are going to be a huge question mark going into next year and Ola Fashanu a guy that James Franklin mentioned in his answer there watching how he performs over the next couple of weeks if he's a guy that fills in uh, at that left tackle position next year that's going to be a big part of that also a guy behind the scenes, Salim Wormley, who is su supposed to be one of the starting interior offensive linemen this year at left guard. He's presumed back next year. Olu Fashunu, we talked about Landon Tangwall, 6'6", 326. Is he a guard or is he a tackle? That's the biggest question I have because if he's a tackle and he can play that position, that solves some of these conversations we're having about Caden Wallace, who again was a top 100 player in his class. By most recruiting services, he was a guard. 
And he's playing, I feel, looking at him out of position. So can you fix some of those problems on the offensive line next year with, and this is the problem if you're Sean Clifford, two first-time starters at the bookends. I'm, we're assuming Juice Scruggs will move to center and Mike Miranda is moving on. And then two players at the guard position you could realistically have four players that are brand new at their position next year. Now, this is wild speculation, but some combination of new starters, good or bad, is coming next season. And it, if for Penn State, it can't get any worse, necessarily, but protecting Sean Clifford would be the key to having him come back because when he is under pressure, he is not a quarterback that can win you games. Plain and simple. Keep him clean. And you do have a shot, and especially if you have a complete team around him. And that comes down to your preference of, do you dance with the devil you know, or you try and find a new one? And to me, I'm always looking for upside. Because this right here, to me, is the ceiling of what you're going to get with Sean Clifford. So ask for better, hope for better, and see what happens. It may end up poorly, but I, I think we know defined what Sean Clifford's ceiling is as a player, as a Nittany Lion. Uh, stay here. Just a quick thing we're going to get to, and then we're going to be talking about hoops with Dave Eckert as they get started in their season here on the BWI Daily Edition. Oh, hello. It's T. Frank. I'm here in my comfy reflecting chair, just thinking, sitting by my fire with my warm cup of nothing in this cup, and... Uh, I'm reflecting about what I'm thankful for. After all, it is the holiday season, and uh, it's the time to do that, to be thankful and reflect on what in your life this past season, this past year, has been good. And for me, I am thankful that I'm no longer afraid. And not of things like hyperinflation or the dark or, if I'm being honest, slugs, like banana slugs, but really any type of slug in general are super disgusting. No, what I'm thankful for is I'm no longer afraid of my male grooming routine. As a modern gentleman, it's important to maintain a certain standard. And in my relationship with my wife, it's a very important thing. And I feel like it's my part and my duty to do so. And for years, I've looked for the, for the equipment to get the job done. There's just nothing. Until I came across the Lawnmower 4.0 from Manscaped. They sent it last month, and it has been great. With the skin safe technology and patent patented ability to reduce nicks and cuts on the Lawnmower 4.0, plus a mega thousand RPM motor, I feel confident that I'm going to be able to give my chestnuts their just due. You can as well with the Lawnmower 4.0, and the good news is if you use the promo code at the bottom of the screen, 20 PSU, you'll get 20% off and free shipping for the holiday season. We'll be telling you more coming up in just a little bit here on the channel about some of their holiday packaging, what you can get for the holiday season. But for now, we're just thankful for 20% off from Manscaped. And don't forget, let me get this out here. Get 20% off with promo code 20PSU at manscaped.com. Be thankful this holiday season for the best gift of all from Manscaped. Your balls will thank you. What? What happened? Welcome back to the BWI Daily Edition. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. Joined now by Dave Eckert, our basketball reporter. He is uh, covering the first season under Micah Shrewsbury, and it's off to a bit of an uneven start. Last night, Penn State loses to UMass on the road. Not a great place to start. How'd the game go down, Dave? Um, very poorly. <laughs> uh, yeah, not much went well, really. You know, I mean, in, in the first half, uh, Penn State went into the break, I think, down four. And look, I mean, they scrapped and clawed to be down four. <laughs> they got to the free throw line. Um, they, they got some offensive rebounds and, and got some second chance points uh, in the first half and kind of gave themselves, themselves a chance while shooting like 35% from the field, which is you don't win games when you shoot that way. And, you know, in the second half, you're like, okay, maybe they'll shoot better. They did not shoot better. And they also stopped doing the other things that were keeping them in the game. So, uh, yeah, they got blown out. 81-56 uh, final score. Um, just about as ugly as it gets, really. So what was it that, 
uh, UMass was doing. There was a couple of things in your article that's over at bluewhiteillustrated.com if people want to check it out to get a recap of the game. Because you might not have seen it. It was on I don't know where. I was looking up, and it was it was not an easily accessible game last night with Monday Night Football going on opposite of the game. So if you didn't see the game, go check out Dave's uh, recap of it. But give the, the what was it that UMass was doing that was frustrating the Penn State offense specifically? Yeah, it was on the uh, Broadcasting Titans CBS Sports Network. Uh, but uh, it was so, – so UMass played a three-quarter court press for large portions of the game. Not the entire time, but a lot. And look, I mean, Penn State fans, people who have watched Penn State basketball have seen Penn State play that a lot. They're not going to be doing very much of that under Micah Shrewsbury. It's very much a Pat Chambers and Jim Ferry thing. But uh, UMass on, on, on Monday used it really well. It, you know, they, they got – eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 seconds off the shot clock before Penn State could get into their sets, which really is the objective of that press, right? I mean, if, if, if it forces a turnover, that's great. Um, but uh, that's not really what it's designed to do. It's just designed to, to get you out of your rhythm and make sure that you don't have the entire shot clock to work with once you get it over half court. So that was really effective. Um, Micah Shrewsbury pointed out, uh, post game that they were really aggressive pushing Penn State out when they caught the ball on the perimeter. Um, so Penn State was not catching the ball in good three-point shooting per, uh, positions, um, which I think is reflected. They shot four of 15 from three. Not good. Uh, so yeah, UMass kind of uh, brought, I think, a creative defensive strategy into this game. They, they switched all of their ball screens, which Penn State was expecting but didn't really react well to, but they were mm-hmm. not expecting that three-quarter court press. So, so yeah. So I guess that's the that's the question then is um why were or were adjustments made that didn't work or were adjustments not really made during the game and how did Mike or Shrewsbury talk about these particular problems that came up afterwards? Yeah, I mean I I didn't notice any real adjustments I, but I guess he he was a little bit critical just of of his guard play and I have mm-hmm. to agree. Uh, it, it, you know, Penn State has some I think the guards that Penn State has are 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 decent they're not bad Jalen Pickett is has uh he's from Siena he's a transfer he was a all-conference player three times in the MAAC or the MAC if you'd like to call it that (laughs) Uh, (laughs) yes he's also player of the year in that conference he's somebody Penn State is depending on wasn't great okay um Jaheim Cornwall also not great Miles Dredd not good so yeah, their guards in this game kind of let them down. They turned it over 14 times, which is too many. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and and really, you know, the the other thing, and Micah Shrewsbury also pointed this out, is there were times where John Hara just had his guy buried under the basket. Like, he's open, he's going to score if you get him the ball, and they didn't get him the ball. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it's, and, and that's part of, you know, the, the way that UMass was playing defense is they're in your face – like far out it's it's hard for you to make that pass right. so again they were doing some things to challenge penn state's guards that i don't think penn state's guards responded super well to uh so let me ask you about that is it not being able to see the floor not having it sounds like this this team doesn't have a, a lot of chemistry as well if you're trying to defeat some things that are in your face and pressed you don't exactly know where your teammates are going to be or how they're going to play. Is that a fair assessment of it's a, it's a team that's played with a lot of transfers, a lot of new faces in a new system? Does that play into some of the early season struggles that they've had? Absolutely. I mean, okay. the, the transfer thing is obvious, right? I mean, Penn State brought in five new scholarship place, uh, faces. Two of them haven't played yet, but still, I mean, you're, you're relying on, on a lot of new guys. And, and the other thing, too, and you kind of touched on it there with the style, is it's not like a small stylistic overhaul that's going on here. It's 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 very considerable, right? If you think of Penn State last season, they were we're going to sell out for turnovers. Mm-hmm. We're going to press you. We are going to play super intense in your face defense to create turnovers because we know that our offense isn't good enough in the half court if the tempo is slow to score points. So we're going to depend on our defense to create offense for us. Mm-hmm. And again, that sounds is like very, Penn State football. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's very much not what Micah Shrewsbury wants. Uh, okay. and, and that's not to say that he doesn't want turnovers and he doesn't want intensity. It's just that he's not selling out for it. He said that to us explicitly. Like, 
it, to him, the better way to play defense is to sit off a little bit, to force your opponent to take bad shots and, and, and play defense that way. So the challenge that creates offensively is now you've got to create in the half court. And that's mm-hmm. something that Penn State isn't, wasn't great at last season. Has it really ever been that awesome at <laughs> uh, it recently? So it's tough. It's it's gonna it's gonna be an adjustment. So and that leads me into my next question: Is have the teams they played so far exposed a fatal flaw in this team, or one that you think is going to be a consistent thing going forward? That most teams are going to say, "Oh, okay, so we can do that," and and that's not something Penn State can fix this season. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think it's a little early to to say that. Okay. I. I, I I get the answer is I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's 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 going to be something that they have to overcome, and certainly I would expect other team, teams to challenge them on it. But look, I mean, again, Micah Shrewsbury coached in the NBA, but you know, he's a guy that knows how to do it. He's he's not going to just try to force a square peg into a round hole all season. That's not that's not going to be what Micah Shrewsbury is going to do. Mm-hmm. So, I think from that perspective, you can have a little bit of confidence if you're a Penn State fan that they might that they, they might figure it out. Uh, but again, it, it, maybe it depends on how long it takes. Penn state doesn't have a lot of time if they want to play around with the postseason. which again, I don't know if that's really a reasonable expectation, probably not, but certainly you can't lose to St. Peter's on Thursday and, and continue down that, that, that road. If you want to have that as a goal for yourself. Yes, so, there, there is, um, the game you mentioned on Thursday, Cornell and then LSU are the uh, Emerald Classic where they then play Oregon State or Wake Forest. So they're going to be getting into some teams here in just a little bit. After that, it's the Big Ten ACC Challenge, December 1st against Miami and then Ohio State on Thanksgiving. Uh, that is that That's the weekend after Thanksgiving. So that's Big Ten Championship weekend. That's right. That's what they're doing there. So um, what are your expectations for this team? I think this is something that most people who follow Penn State Hoops probably have some gauge but they're still calibrating. But for everyone else that is very casual in their following of this team, what are your expectations for Penn State basketball this year? And have they been adjusted since you saw the first two games? Not really. Um, Certainly they lost uh, in a way that I did not think that they were going to lose on Monday. Uh, But uh, from, from an overall expectation standpoint, I think, Look, they're, they're trying to build something this year. If, if they get in anything on top, that's gravy. I don't think it should be expected. Um, you know, I think, you know, if you're a Penn State fan, you hope for a couple good wins. You hope to see some things that inspire confidence um, in, in this team. But but the interesting thing, though, is, and I wrote about this. I wrote a little feature on it um, on, on bluewhiteillustrated.com if you'd like to subscribe to On3 for just $1. Uh, <laughs> that... that you know, they've got some older guys on this team, right? There, there's some guys who are in their last go around here. Yeah. So it's, 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 and, and a lot of them came in just before this season. So that's, it's kind of a little bit of a rub, right? Like you're trying to build something, you're trying to build a platform, but you've got players who are like, Hey, this is my last shot at it. Like, let's do something. Yeah. You know, so, so, so they have ambitions to win now, certainly because of those guys. I just, I don't know if that's realistic. Yeah, it seems like it's a really interesting position to be in when you put it that way. And thank you, by the way, for uh, doing some of that lifting on the promo stuff. I appreciate that. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit like on this video if you've been enjoying the BWI Daily Edition. When you do that, everyone knows it's a good video. And, of course, we grow how many people watch and see Blue White Illustrated, which helps these videos keep coming. So hit the like, hit notification, hit subscribe. All the buttons you can click, please go ahead and click them. Especially if you're at this point in the show. Like, we're about to wrap up here. So if you've made it through this this far, you're clearly in. So just it's one more step. Appreciate it. So with that in mind, of it's a veteran team. This is the last question that I have is, are there young players that you should be excited about and looking for progress on that end? If it's a veteran team and you're not sure if they can compete right now and you're building for the future... What are the building blocks that Penn State fans should be looking at this year? Uh, the the young players are the recruiting class. It's coming in next season because there oh. there are there are not aren't making that, it easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, there are that. There's literally, I think, three scholarship underclassmen on the roster. Uh, so, oh. uh, you know, a guy who's playing right now is Dalian Johnson. He's getting some auxiliary minutes. Maybe if you want to watch him, he's a guard. Uh, he can shoot it a little bit. You know, he's got some game. Um, I don't expect him to be a, a real asset for Penn State this season, but 
you know, I, I mean, beyond that, right, like Jalen Pickett's got another year if he wants it. Uh, Seth Lundy also, Miles Dredd. There are guys that, like, aren't going to leave after the season necessarily. But as far as, you know, like real building blocks, uh, I'm not really sure if there are many young building blocks here. Uh, that's going to be done um, on the recruiting trail. I, I'm doing my best to cover that as in-depth as possible if you want to read about it. But, yeah, the, the the young talent on this roster, there's not a ton of it. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> next game is Thursday. It's on Big Ten Plus, which might as well be C-SPAN 3 for a lot of people. So, uh, yeah, if you want to check out the game and check out everything that Dave has been doing, bluewhiteillustrated.com. We'll have some more updates here and there throughout the season on Penn State basketball because it is, a, it is the beginning of the program, and we need to give it its just coverage. But in the middle of Penn State football season, even if it is the season that it is, uh, that's going to be our priority here for the next couple of weeks. But Dave, thank you so much for coming on, filling us in on what the other stuff going on with Penn State sports, especially with basketball. Appreciate it. You got it, T. Frank. Anytime. That'll do it today for the BWI Daily Edition. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts because we got great stuff coming out. The recruiting podcast is out on Tuesdays as well. And if you want to listen to the audio version, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss anything here from Blue White Illustrated. We'll talk to you tomorrow.